I need something special, like this, but me. Could you do that? What are you talking about, man? This is a video essay about the 1979 Abel Ferrara film, Driller Killer. Two quick things. First, I do know it's called The Driller Killer, but, and maybe this is a message to the Abel Ferrara of 1979, I don't know. Over the years, I've just gotten used to calling it Driller Killer. Kind of a cleaner name. Secondly, this really isn't about Driller Killer in the way that you might think. It's more of a story which has Driller Killer at the center, but, you know, you're probably used to this by now. So, cast your mind back to life in London in 1983. Petrol was £1.67 a gallon, whatever that means. Breakfast TV had just started. Gandhi won big at the Oscars. And I had just learned about the existence of the VCR. For those who don't know, a VCR was a video cassette recorder, the machine which played video cassettes. Video cassettes came in two formats at that time, the superior Betamax and the inferior VHS or video home system and at some point in 1983 I found myself at the party of what I'm going to call a rich kid whose parents owned a VCR. I don't remember if it was Betamax or VHS but what I do remember is that we started watching Jaws and my mind was blown. A machine that could allow you to watch any film you liked whenever you wanted. I was obsessed. My mum came to pick me up long before the film ended and I did not want to leave the comforting glow of the VCR but leave we had to so I did not get to watch all of the film. As a result, Jaws was not the first film I watched all of on video. From that point on, I talked about VCRs all the time and there was really nothing else in the world I wanted more. But, sadly, for my family, VCRs in 1983 were prohibitively expensive in the UK and there was no way in hell that we were going to get one. To add insult to injury, for my birthday that year, I received two VHS tapes, but no machine to play them on. Ain't that just the way? And then, as luck would have it, some new neighbours moved in upstairs. Now, 1983 wasn't just a good year for Richard Attenborough, it was also a good year for punks. And the neighbours who moved in upstairs were three punks. We developed a kind of Mikasa Sukasa understanding with these people. And pretty soon, we were all moving freely upstairs and downstairs between the two flats. I do not have any photos of this period, so I'm choosing to illustrate it with some images from the UK TV show The Young Ones, because it really was like that, trust me. My stepfather at the time was a roadie for Hawkwind, as well as other bands, and we spent a lot of time hanging out with bands and their friends. I even spent a whole night selling tickets to a Damned concert once. And this guy, was one of the many people who used to look after me when everyone was busy. True story. Anyway, the VCR. So eventually, the punks upstairs got hold of a VCR. Lord knows how. Oh, have we got a video? If anyone else asks me that question. Oh, have we got a video? Yes, we've got a video! But I was given the okay to go upstairs and watch the two cassettes I'd received for my birthday anytime I liked. As it happened, the first time I took our punk neighbours up on this offer, they were just about to watch a film. And I had to watch the film with them and wait until it was over before I put my tapes on. And that was how, in 1983, the first film I ever saw on video ended up being Abel Ferrara's Driller Killer. I should point out that these were the very next two films I saw, and when you put these three films next to each other, well... I don't know, tells a bit of a story, no? One of my beliefs in general is that it is difficult to untangle our experiences from the films we watch, and also that we're somewhat made by the films we watch, or the films we like, at least. What does it mean for these to be the first three films that someone watches on video? I don't know, I'm sure you have thought so. I didn't remember a great deal from watching Driller Killer. Really, it was only this scene that played out in my head over and over again in the years that followed. And I can only really show you a little bit of it because I've made this weird rule for myself that I'd rather not feature bad language and violence on this channel. Fans of Ferrara, just wait a little, we'll come back to this. But I'd like to talk about something else first. Now, you may remember me telling a story previously about my 1989 quest to find the scariest film ever made. And how it ended, weirdly, me picking up a copy of the Andy Warhol film Lonesome Cowboys. I want to come back to this quickly because I only told half the story and Driller Killer is kind of key here in a way. So we left off with me renting every horror film from my local video store in a quest to find the scariest film ever made, but failing. One of the reasons I failed was because in 1989, what we think of as the scariest films ever made were not available in the UK, and it was because of this lady. Born in Nuneaton in Warwickshire in 1910, which makes a lot of sense, Mary Whitehouse formed the National Viewers and Listeners Association, the NVLA, in 1965, and began a campaign to clean up British television. To be honest, I was completely unaware of any of this TV stuff that she did, but what I was aware of was the NVLA's work in the 1980s, focusing on videos available in the UK. She coined the term Video Nasty about a select group of films that she took against and through the NVLA she campaigned hard until the Video Recordings Act of 1984 was introduced and a number of films were banned in the UK on video. 
Subsequently, in 1989, when I was looking for the scariest films ever made, they simply weren't on the shelves anywhere. But I had books, lots of books, and I found out what these films were, and I put the word out that I was interested in seeing them. As luck would have it, one of these films, The Exorcist, was still having a weekly midnight screening at a cinema on Baker Street every Friday night, and me and a friend went to see it. Imagine being two young teens and seeing The Exorcist, a banned film, and a midnight screening on your own. What a thrill. As it went, The Exorcist wasn't really my thing, but I enjoyed the hell out of the experience anyway. So the quest continued, and finally, word reached someone, and a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend managed to get me two films on VHS, which I received in a plastic bag one day, and about a week to watch them before returning them. These two videos were completely blank. No labels, no markings of any sort whatsoever. I knew what was on them, but to look at the tapes, you would have had no idea. They radiated an ominous quality which is difficult to explain. These were contraband. Outlawed. The first tape I watched contained Sam Raimi, 1981 film The Evil Dead. This film had a lot of baggage for me because a good friend of mine at school had seen it spoke about it often. Additionally, one time when he and I had gone to the cinema together in 1987, he had snuck into a screening of Evil Dead 2 just for a few moments and achieved legendary status with the tales of what he'd seen on the screen. The Evil Dead was obviously wonderful, but it still wasn't that terrifying experience I've been looking for all summer. But fear not, because there was another. The second unmarked tape, Toby Hooper's 1974 film, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I'm going to refer to from now on as TCM. And let me say this, I don't think it's really possible to recreate the experience of what it was like for me to watch that film in 1989. Like, I don't think it would be possible for you or anyone else to go through a similar viewing experience. I watched it in broad daylight, the world all friendly and busy and active outside, and yet I was tight-chested, drenched in sweat, gripping the arms of the chair throughout. I cannot stress this enough. This was a banned film. It had been deemed too dangerous for people in this silly country to watch. And that adds a hell of a lot of extra weight to the experience of seeing it as a young teen. Added to that is the fact that TCM just isn't like a lot of other films. It's made with real intention. A lot of films don't really go all in on how they shoot things or how they cover a scene. They'll flip from one thing to another and they'll over cover scenes from every angle because they don't really know what they want to be. And subsequently, they don't make their films with any strong intentions, but TCM knows what it is, what it wants to be all the time. Her. And then there's the sound. Possibly more than any other film I'd ever seen, TCM really taught me a lesson about sound. Sure, it's low budget, shot on 60mm, with a cast of largely amateur actors, but there's nothing cheap or amateurish about that soundtrack. In fact, the film's editor, Sally Richardson, found the film anything but scary while she was editing it. But after the sound had been laid into the film, she suddenly no longer wanted to be working on it alone anymore. It changed everything. This was what I had been looking for all that summer of 1989. I'd struck gold. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, this is supposed to be a video essay about Triller Killer, and you've talked about everything but Triller Killer. To which I would say, yep, all right, now wait just a minute. Because after watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I sought out a lot of other films on the video nasty list. But that was really the big hitter for me. The one film I did not seek out on that list was the one film I'd already seen, Triller Killer. And then, in 2013, 30 years later, I watched Triller Killer again. So what was it like to become reacquainted with something I'd seen so long ago it barely existed in my memories? Well, it was quite a trip. For a start, if you'd asked me what Driller Killer was like prior to re-watching it, I would have said it was like this. But upon re-watching it, I learned that it's actually like this.
label's influence at the time he made Driller Killer was Mean Streets, which very much shows Driller Killer is really more of a socio-political psychodrama about an artist struggling with the world around him than it is a film about someone killing people with a drill. It's a slice of New York that no longer exists. It's a slice of filmmaking that no longer exists. It's a slice of a way of life that no longer exists. I had absolutely no memories of these moments, none whatsoever. Pretty much the entire film, other than the killing scenes, were all file not found for me. It was like I'd never seen any of it before. But here's the thing. Why would I remember any of these moments when they were so close to the world I was living in back when I was a child? You might think that looking at these scenes now is like going through an archive, but that's not how it would have felt to me at the time at all. I saw this film four years after it was made, essentially the same time period. We lived in a world of musicians and punks, people dressed like that, behaved like that, interiors looked like that. For me to watch this film as a child and remember these bits would have been like, hell, remember that guy from Jarmusch's Mystery Train who only takes photographs of the hotel rooms because those are the things that no one remembers? Yeah, maybe it would have been like that. Something else that really jumped out at me when re-watching the film were the eating scenes. There are two in particular, which is hard not to notice when you see the film as an adult. The moment with the pizza and the moment with the milk burger combo. But there's also another moment in Driller Killer that for me closely connects to food and it's this bit. It's a present for you and your girlfriend. It's a rabbit. Hey, you don't know how to cook it? It's delicious. When I was a child, we used to eat rabbit. And let me tell you, they freaked me the hell out. I mean, look at the thing. Nightmarish. But this too would have been a regular sight for me in 1983. This would have just been the wallpaper of my life. We all have that experience of revisiting something we saw when we were young and learning that it contained jokes or references that went over our heads at the time. But this was different. And what occurred to me re-watching Driller Killer is that all of us probably have something we can re-watch that will take us much deeper. Our own unique version of Proust having that Madeline with tea. Something that will carry us down Byzantine corridors that we were not expecting. You have it too, but I don't know what your key is that will unlock this door for you. There's a term in screenwriting called the inciting event. It's something that usually occurs in the first 20 minutes or so that causes the drama to begin, gets the ball rolling. You might think of it as Travis meeting Iris and Taxi Driver and getting that greasy bill from sport, or Jeffrey finding the ear in Blue Velvet. But if I ask you what your inciting event is, what is the one thing that happened in your life that has resulted in you being where you are and who you are now, well, I should hope that you don't have an answer for that. We simplify talking about films into language that doesn't refer to the depth and complexity of our own lives. And perhaps that's a shame. Would my life have changed radically if the first video I'd seen had been Jaws? Maybe. We'll never know. But what I do know is that I would really like to live in a world where the films we watch are as difficult to explain as the lives we lead. So how can I sum up what I learned from my experience watching Driller Killer in 1983 and then again in 2013? Maybe it goes like this. Our own lives are impossible to untangle from the films we watch. Perhaps the films we watch make us who we are. Nothing is simple, everything is complicated, and I would love for you to go on a journey like this too. Cool. Payment of the full amount for telephone service is required by this date to avoid interruption of your outgoing service. And five days later, termination of your incoming service. That's tomorrow. They're going to come and turn it off tomorrow. Turn it off, huh? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my